Hi everyone, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, so uh, I am a game AI specialist uh, and today we're going to see together artificial intelligence 101 are those things I wish I knew when I started. Uh, so disclaimer, um, it's going to be fast, I swear a lot and I have a thick accent, enjoy. And so my job is to make fake homicidal people for a living, and I really like my job. So who am I? I'm Stephanie Bouchard. I am a senior system uh, designer for, and I have an AI specialization. And I am currently the CEO of Stockholm Syndrome AI. We are a firm that does uh, custom AI systems, uh, and we do design and implementation for different clients. So basically, I've been doing like full-time AI for a while now. Um, my team also works on, on an R&D project called Synthetic Soul. I'll tell you more about this later. So I shipped a bunch of games and I also corrupted the souls of unsuspecting students. And um, basically my philosophy in life is that you should take your feelings, turn them into numbers, and then use those numbers to generate more feelings. I'm a procedural kind of, kind of guy. Um, the game design is a big family. And if you take creative direction, of course, we separate in tech, art, and game direction. And then it goes further down and further down. So basically, the AI uh, trade lives inside agency. So we're kind of like the mirror of like the, the tree C player component, if you want. So what I mean by artificial intelligence in video game is, so uh, we talk about agents. Agents is an autonomous entity that observes the world through sensors and will act on their environment. So usually we make them so they can, we can define and they can achieve goals and they are perceived as rational. So the, we make rules that make sane, like sense and humans think that they're not insane. Uh, sometimes, not always, and most of the time not, but sometimes they can also use knowledge to learn and improve. So we also talk about an agent depth the depth of an agent is like um, how complex it is. So if we take this thermostat here, technically your thermostat at, at home is an agent in a sense that it's a machine that sends the environment, thinks that it's too cold, increase the, like starts the, the, the thermostat, like a, the, the heater for a while and then reach the point where it's sufficiently warm. So it doesn't need to, to do that anymore and then it stops. So your thermostat is infinitely powerful in your world, the same way my agents are in video games. So actual AI, like machine learning and everything, is used in data analysis, robotics, and a little bit in video games, but not that much. What we use is more like game AI. So game AI is used to, to simulate agent in a, in a game world. World, and, and we focus on three different types of game AI. So utility, which is decision making, relatableness, which are like all the support system that make your, your character act, like in a sense of actor, uh, in a sense of like having feelings and being relatable by humans, being able to read what they think. Uh, and then pattern recognition, which is actual machine learning, which we never use most of the time. So uh, we're not going to talk about this one today. If you have further questions about that, I'm available after, but we're going to focus on utility and a bit of relatableness today. So uh, agent categories in gameplay, uh, what are the types of agents that we have? So uh, basically we have kind of like this spectrum of three types of category. Uh, so as we mentioned before, Agents have the capacity uh, and condition and state to exert the power in your world. So they will come in and wreck your stuff. That's what they do. So we have, of course, natural agents. So those are players. The players are he real humans that are inserted into an avatar that can then interact with the world. They will use a controller to do transduction of their will into the machine. Then uh, we have artificial agents, like little NPCs, trying to pretend to be natural agents. So those are bots. Uh, the bots have mechanics and goals that are symmetrical to a human player. So their goal in the world is to really like be against or be like with a player in the way the player is playing. So they are a special type of NPCs. And then you have like generic other NPCs. So usually those guys are more like the the parsley, <laughs> like the, the, the window dressing of video games. So they, they just like hang out. They're like the civilians, the wildlife, they're everything you want, like in the background. And they also like come in and interact with your player once in a while. Uh, they are like your numerous like quest givers and merchants. Like they have very specific jobs that usually players don't do. Then, uh, so yeah, like 
the, we, it, they kind of live on a gradient of, of AI-ness. So some of the, 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 the human systems are used by bots and some of the NPC systems are used by bots too. So this is interesting because even in the, in the avatar of a human player, there's most of the time like little systems that are kind of like AI driven, in game AI driven, in the sense that uh, like, for example, Geralt in The Witcher will talk to itself or like so in most of the games also, like if you're lost for too long, like they will like trigger a little like speech of like, hey, do you remember like we were supposed to talk to these guys, like what's going on and stuff. So um, even in the case of human player, like sometimes we play animation or we play like little things to, to remind the player. And this is part of kind of like game AI also. We don't do it enough, like we should do more of that. That could be fun. So how does agency works for a player? So uh, according to the hallways of Ubisoft uh, that came up with the concept of three Cs, uh, we have a character, a camera, and, a, con and a, a controller. So the, the pairing of those three together will create your, your user experience. Uh, so the shape of your body and the way it is like jointed together, um, the, the way your camera is display displaying information as you go will also influence your experience. And the, the way your input, your will inside the machine will also influence your, your experience. So for example, if we take E-Honda from Street Fighter, like the way you would do pummel is by pressing a series of buttons where uh, for Sabine from Final Fantasy, this guy, you just like select pummel from like a menu. And then the guys from Gang Beast, you just like try to pummel <laughs> and it's usually not a success. So, um, so 3Cs is also part of the human computer interaction loop. Uh, this loop is uh, basically a guy with a mallet that plays at computer games. Uh, and what happened is that, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the user will see what's going on with the game, will take a decision on what to do next, will put it in the controller, and then the game is gonna basically like take decisions according to this, try to make his life more difficult, display this to the user in many ways, and then it's gonna circle like this for a while. So uh, as you can see, like the the body of the, let's pretend that this is the game, <laughs> the body of the user, what the, the user sees in the controller is basically defining their experience. And they take, they take notice and basically like decide what to do next. So they take decisions. How does it work for AI? So on this side, basically AI also have kind of like a three C's. It's not exactly the same. This, the systems are not built the same way, but it's it's kind of like the same thing. So um, so yeah, like so if we take the same loop again for HCI, the the AI has a body, and they perceive the the world around them. And then they have like a set of information and, and actions they can take. And from this set of action, they will decide what to do next. So it's kind of like uh, an eight, if you want. So the, the player do things and then the AI does things and then the, the, the user does things and then it comes back. So uh, the, the NPC takes decisions, right? So how does it work? Uh, taking decision for an AI is actually more complicated but easier than it seems. So the the way character behaves in a world is not by having like a very structured strategy and like thinking about what things are going to happen. Like we just give them a, a set of statistics and like little thresholds that basically like if certain thresholds are reached, uh, something good's going to happen or something bad's going to happen. So they, they usually like will trigger actions according to uh, their best chances of having something good happen and not something bad happen. So the, the real strategy is kind of like perceived by the player. More on that later. So we'll talk with perception. Uh, perception is the ability to see, uh, hear, or become aware of something. So it's a way of seeing the world and understanding what's going on uh, and doing kind of like an interpretation of what that means for you and creating a mental impression. This relates, in the, the case of players, to a concept that game designers call game state versus game view. So depending on the game, the game state and the game view can be symmetrical. So if we take tic-tac-toe here, uh, from the grid that you have and the tokens on the side, you know everything, like all the moves that have happened before, and you can also project all the moves that are gonna happen after. So basically game state and game view is one thing. In the case of, of like more complex games, in the case of StarCraft, for, for example, uh, 
what you see as a player and like your units is not the same as everything that is going on in the whole game. So which means that I don't want to scare you, but under this fog of war, something might be happening. And this is part of the surprise and part of the element of strategy. So what we want to do with game AI is we want to simulate this thing, especially in the case of, of like 3D uh, open world games. So to do this, what we do is uh, we, we kind of like use this kind of like board game like loop. So human take an action, NPC take an, act an action, and then usually like world managers, like the, the AI that spawns units and like uh, look at the world and see if the mission is, is over or whatever, like will do things. And then it's the, the turn of the player again. So this loops like this, and this is kind of like what we use to, to make them uh, keep the pace and take decisions. So we have two ways of, do of doing this. In the case of a 3D world, uh, we will try to, uh, to enhance the feeling of uh, data acquired over time to give the impression uh, that, uh, that basically the enemies don't know everything in the world as it's happening. In the case of, a, of kind of like a board game-like kind of game, um, the, all this information that you see here is not seen by the player, by, by the, the agent. It's, it's kind of like a, a nice decor that's been set up for the, for, for the, the player to see. So the, the AI just see like, a, the, like a, a series of numbers basically in the background. So the way it works is for open world 3D, uh, we use this uh, broadcasting system called STIMS. So STIMS are similis, uh, singular or simile plural. It's little packets of information that, you're, that are floating around your world and basically reach your little NPCs. So the way it works is your NPC has some sensors and you will have like an emitting source. It can be any element in your world, like, a, like the player or other NPCs or like a, a park bench, anything. And then uh, these guys are usually emitting information. So the player says, I'm a player, or like you could have a label like this is a, like a, a little like bush tree thing and you can hide inside, or it can be like an NPC being like, I want to kill you. Um, and then as the information is reaching, the construct of your NPC, it will take note and it will update its uh, its in inner data set. So we use labels on objects. So this is a chair, this is a zombie, this is a bush. And then we use mathematical construct to interact with each other. So we have different type, like the radius, the radius, uh, Cone vision, or a, a heat map. So like in your nav mesh, you can hide information. And then uh, that's it. So for in the case of radius, this is very cool. We usually use it to uh, to simulate uh, usually like uh, audio, like sound perception, or if you want to have like colliders, uh, either to pick up objects or uh, to to know if you're colliding into something or triggering smart objects. Smart objects we're going to talk about later on. But the goal of this is to have like a kind of like a known bubble that the player is going to be able to estimate for things to start happening. Then we have the recast. The recast is like taping like a big stick to do your player's head. And it's a little bit like, because your player, your, your avatar, like your NPC is, is blind, technically. Even if the, the mesh has eyes, it cannot see. And I know it sounds like a bit dumb, but some, some of my bosses didn't know that. So basically, this is like what's simulating their eyes. So when the stick like touch an object, the label on the object is going to be like, I'm a duck. And then the, the, the NPC is going to be able to, to do something about it. So this is kind of like the simple version of Conavision. Conavision is kind of like the fancier version of it. So it's like a bunch of recasts taped together to kind of be like one big uh, simulation of the, the, the field of vision of a human. Uh, we usually use those uh, in games where there's a, a stealth element, right? Uh, and if you have like a very cool, very advanced stealth element in your game, then you might have like a super complex cone of vision. So it's like cone of vision stacked on each other. And we basically use these to recreate like deeper the, the field of perception of how humans see things. So if you see this fence is squirrel, uh, the way human treats vision at the center, peripheral and like further away is very different. I recommend that you take a look into this. We won't have time today, but it's very nice. And then we have uh, all the heat map in, in relation with the nav mesh. So what happens is that we usually use these to either um, like 
simulate olfaction, like the, the fact that an NPC can smell. So what we do is we, if the player goes around, it will leave a little trail in the nav mesh and there will be a little timer on each of those like little square things. And as the timer is on, it means that the NPC can pick up this information and it can like follow this trail. So even if the character does not see you or does not hear you, it can still like find you, for example. Uh, the same thing with, for example, a death, a death count. So if you're in a room and you know that, so for example, like an NPC walks in, get killed by the player, like the player is in bush somewhere, another guy walks in and then gets killed by the player, then it's going to generate kind of like this like stain here. So the next NPC that walks in can tell that basically all of your friends died here, some of your friends died here. You might, you might want to position your, your, yourself somewhere here, right? So, and this was for 3D World components. We use a heat map for like so many other things. And if you have questions, I will be available at the end. Uh, but we will now see the perception uh, from a strategy game kind of uh, perception. So what we do for those guys, usually uh, those AIs are directly hooked in the blackboard of the world. So uh, the same way NPC characters have a little blackboard inside of them with all the, the variables that they are tracking over time, Usually your world manager, which is like the big meta invisible AI, kind of like have one too. It might look like something like this. Super attractive. I know you guys are like, oh, wow, all the stats. And I'm like, yes. So to, uh, to make sure that the, okay, so humans don't like to play with super powerful AI. They want to have a chance to win because humans are whiny. So what we do is uh, to ensure that our NPCs are making mistakes. Um, what we do is we hide some information and then we give them like a structure of, of decision making that usually like intends that for them to use some of those information. And then we have them like guess what's the best course of option. And sometimes we even make them like make mistake on purpose just to give the players a chance. So what we've just seen is that humans will receive info, uh, no, sorry, NPCs will receive information. They update their inside, their, their little AI world inside of them, the little blackboard. And then it just like goes on like this, which brings us to the brain. So the information that fluctuate inside the NPCs will influence the brain. The brain is kind of like this little, uh, little like uh, set of all the possible interaction uh, in the world for for the for the NPCs. So we have uh, different patterns, different sets of priorities, and we have <clears throat> different different structure. So usually, when I start a new project uh, with a new team, we try to we go see like the creative director or the game director, and we're like, okay, what does your AI do? And they're like, they do everything. And I'm like, no. No, they cannot do anything, everything like it's going to be so expensive and so hard to maintain. What's the focus of your AI? Usually most of the time they pick those. So this is MDA. It's a framework that was developed 2004 to uh, kind of like elaborate what are the dominant, uh, the dominant dynamics in your game. Dynamics are kind of like the things you're looking at in your systems to know if, you're, you're, if your player is winning or not like how they track their progression and how they track their, their success, if you want, right? So uh, usually most of the time, our AI and usually our players uh, are trying to move around in a world, trying to look for each other uh, and, and position themselves in a way that makes sense. They try to find a place and like go towards it. And like if it's blocked, they're going to try to go around. And they're also trying to use elements in the world. So like they're, they're supposed to be able to position themselves or fit things together. So it's really like understanding the environment and, and like the physicality of like the world in itself. Uh, they also usually most of the time try to not die. So they're trying to survive. Uh, and most of the time the player also. So like they will adapt usually their, their um, strategy as as they're losing their energy to try to safeguard safeguard themselves so they can they can play longer with the, the player uh, and most of the time uh, they do chase and evasion so chase and evasion is basically the concept of like hey the player is like okay i'm attacking you or like the other way around like the the npc is like hey i'm attacking you and then they chase each other on the screen for a while so the other things here uh sometimes they do like especially uh, territorial acquisition if you're playing like chess or something like that. Um, but their prediction is really limited. Like what they do is not really like 
see what's going on and, and like make a, a very strong strategy. They just like play moves, to see what's going to happen. And uh, sometimes they construct things, but usually it's like kind of like scripted. And uh, most of the time, uh, we will not allow our NPCs to collect uh, things from the ground because we want the player to be able to pick up like ammos or elf or whatever. Um, and they, we usually don't want them to be able to trade uh, money or use uh, resources most of the time also. I've seen, I've seen like, there is like some strategy game where it's the case, uh, but if you're doing like usually war games, that's not like a, with like first person shooter style kind of game, that's not your interest. Um, it, but if you're doing like a more like strategy games or like more factorial-ish kind of thing, like usually you do a bit of trading a little bit more. So a brain, uh, yeah, it's kind of like the, the NPC version of a controller. So a controller is basically like those buttons that you press to make things happen. A brain is kind of like the same thing. It's everything you can happen and there's little doors opening and closing to allow you to do it or not. The way it works is uh, the brain contains behavior that are, that are built with little patterns. The little patterns of, are kind of like little sequences that are lined up to create the impression of a strategy, right? So patterns is a set of instruction for an agent to perform. So it's the NPC version of a mechanic, if you want. So a pattern is a cluster of information. So like it can tell the NPC how to position itself or aim and what animations to play with their body. Uh, can they layer some of them and like, should they say something? Should they bark or do something? So for example, if we say jump forward, um, you have to have a position that is like at this distance of an enemy or something else and or, or the player. Uh, your position does not matter in this context. Aiming does not context. It, it doesn't uh, matter in this context. Or maybe you want to aim for the floor, let's say. And then uh, in this case, you will play the animation jump forward and you will say woohoo because I don't know, Mario or something. That's great. So uh, the same thing. And once we, we have the instructions set and a name for it, what's going to happen is that we're going to uh, we're also going to add like add some um, some conditions. So this cannot be true unless the player is conscious. It's currently on the ground. The NPC is is uh, standing, and its current velocity is above X, like above a certain number. If all of these are true, the NPC could decide to jump forward if you wanted. So, uh, a brain is like really like a bunch of those guys, and uh, if you have patterns that are generic enough, they can also be reused from one. Uh, one behavior to another. This is great because this way you can have uh, in between your little, little like pocket animations and barks that can just like augment the variation of your combat, for example, if it can also be reused in like taking cover and all those kind of things or in communication or whatever else. There's some stuff that you, you want to segregate in certain specific behavior. Like for example, if you have ambient filler of uh, an NPC eating a chocolate bar, you don't want to have your NPC like eating a chocolate bar in cover while the other ones are shooting, or maybe, but like most of the time, that's not what you want. Um, so what we do is we usually in the condition, we attribute uh, a behavior like type in, in the little uh, pattern. So this way, if you're in a behavior, your chances of, select, of selecting those behavior is usually increased or it's gonna block everything else. So for example, if we say that we have uh, behaviors of attack and defense, uh, we have hit reactions because it's also a behavior, uh, but it's a, an uncontrollable one. Uh, you have like uh, hide, idling, um, patterns and then you have conversation patterns so we could say that for example like conversation is green idling is blue combat is red and then uh yeah so when i i'm in a conversation my next selection is also going to be a conversation so according to the conditions we were talking before uh what's going to happen is that from all these little patterns, some of them are not going to be available right now because either the cooldown is not done, the conditions are not met, something is going on. So the AI is going to select something else. The NPC is going to select something else. So most of the time, like you should never have a case where there's nothing to do. This is why we have like default idling and other things because otherwise you're your NPC is going to go like kind of weirdly dormant and uh, the human players are going to notice 
and it's going to look broken. So as I mentioned before, if you select, like for example, like three escaping behavior, and then you stop, and then you select like four attacking player uh, pattern, and then uh, sadly enough, you get shot. So you play your death by ray gun patterns, then it gives the impression that you were attacking, you were running away from the enemy, you started, oops, attacking it, and then sadly enough, you died. So it's not something that overall the AI wanted to do. It's just a sequence of things that happen. And like those here are kind of like projected by the player. That's what the player understand your NPC was trying to do. And we do this using little uh, logical switches. The way it works is your brain uh, usually has a shape. So it can be it can be more or less intricate, more or less structured and like have a, a stronger or, or looser hierarchy. Uh, but in all the cases, there is advantages and disadvantages of to, to like all the, the types of, of brain structure uh, in game. So usually we have four of them that are mainly like, a, I would say widespreadly used in game. So either you can program your, your cases or you can have a state machine. Uh, you can use behavior trees or you can use a, a UT selection, utility selection matrix. So uh, doing, in, uh, doing your, your logic in, in, the, in code is very nice if you have a very small set of behaviors that contain a very small set of patterns, and most of your patterns are kind of like mutually exclusive. Um, usually what happens is that maintaining your, your logic by code is nice. Uh, and if you're using like a switch case kind of like structure to try to emulate the state machine, it's going to be easier. But if you just try to build the logic of an AI with like and if bracket bracket like meow meow stuff happens, um, this is going to be hard, especially if you have like a lot of exception case where you're like, oh, if this and this happens, then don't run. But then like if anything else happened, then do. Uh, it's, it's hard because uh, sometimes people like forget the bracket and then it breaks your whole AI or like people try to deal an exception and it's like super complex and it builds this like giant kind of like text. Um, and when your game designer dies and you have to bring in a new game designer, like this is a nightmare. That new person will be like, why is it built this way? It's so hard. So uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, it's, it's like a nightmare for exception management, everything, and you will go insane. Every programmer have to do it once. And I would recommend that game designers do it once too, to understand like the horror of the whole thing. But I would recommend that you try something better. So once you went with code once and you 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 just like know that you will never do it again, uh, I would recommend finite state machine. Finite state machines are very cool if you're making like a card game or if you have a, a, lim a limited set of actions or like if you're doing like arcade fighting styles, like things, this is like, those are your, be your best friends. Um, so it's a simple visual scripting tool. So, uh, and basically each of your little behaviors are a little script. It's like your little pattern that we were talking about uh, earlier. So like it can be C sharp or Python or whatever. And then each of those little arrows here represent a series of conditions that needs to be true for the logic to flow from one state to another. So when, you, when you're in C, then the animation, like your, your character is going to do certain animation, they will see certain things, and then like, let's say the player is detected, then it'll be like, oh, and they will go like into uh, like aggressive research behavior. And then once they, they find the player again, then they will enter combat. And when the player is either defeated or is lost, then they will go back to kind of like this idle kind of, kind of move. Um, state machines are great, uh, limited, but great, but like highly structured. And you can also stack them in bigger state machines. So it becomes kind of like a spaghetti, but it's, it's like a better conditional management. It's like visually interesting for people doing maintenance. Um, and you also, uh, you also have the option of turning your, your state machines into code automatically after, if you want, uh, it's, it's lighter to operate. So behavior trees, it's like the state machines, but instead of, of like checking all of your, your variables separately every time, uh, that you, that you are in a behavior, this guy's like, they kind of like learn as they go. So logic comes from the top, from the root and usually goes from, from uh, left to right. And we, we hit little conditional blocks uh, that will allow you to go 
into one direction or no. So if you try to do A and it's possible, then uh, and all the conditions are met, then A is going to be activated and it's going to be the end and the logic is going to go back to the root and you're going to do the same thing again. If you hit condition and uh, A is not available right now, you will go to behavior B. And that's why usually your, your uh, last behavior on the right is kind of like your default option. Uh, what we also do is we usually put the deadliest stuff at the beginning and then we go towards the right, like towards the most, like the more default kind of things. Um, it can be very simple or it can be very complex. And the thing that is super cool is that you could jump from E here back to this little tree here that does maybe like something else and then like go back to combat or something, which is like a more complex tree. So unlike the state machines, you don't need to have like a very finite loop that take care of all of your like structure and like like for example in this case here i would not be able to go from this state machine to that one it wouldn't be allowed whereas this tree could call the other one the last one which is not widely used which is my favorite and this is also a form of mental illness which is amazing i love mental illness uh so the basically this is a utility matrix so all of the little uh, patterns are lined up in the first uh, row here, the first column. And so these are all the actions. So, and the empty rows means that it's like the same behavior that can be called in more than one way. Uh, and then you have, uh, you have like the, the parameters that must be true. And then according to all the things that are true, like there will be like compounding weights that are gonna be added to your, your little uh, like scoring system, if you want. So basically what's gonna happen is that at the end, uh, the the more possible action will float to the top, let's say, to give it a visual aspect. And then if you have one dominant strategy, that's what's going to be performed. But if you have more than one that score exactly the same for a known reason, it's going to basically roll a dice and see what's going to happen. Um, this is like all of this is a very simplified version of this. Um, but we tend to use a utility matrix uh, in the case of larger population on screen, because running this is a lot lighter than running behavior trees, for example. Uh, and it's also easier to manage exceptions, but there's no way to visually debug what's going on with your characters. Your only hope is to have your, your character displayed on screen, your NPCs on screen with like, what are your current behavior, like your, your current pattern, what you're saying, what's your animation, and what you think you did last, and what you think you're doing next. And from this, game designers have to infer what rule was broken when they see a behavior being like incorrect or behaving weird. So awesome, the bomb, not widely, not widely used. Uh, we we suspect it's going to be is going to gain in popularity. Most uh, pro people are scared of it because they say that it doesn't scale that well. But I believe we can use ML to make it better. More on that later if you have questions. So, if we resume, brains have shapes and structure and hierarchy. They're all built of a bunch of little chunks of, of, of behaviors, little patterns that are being called in, in random order or like structured order or, or like based on conditions. And we can structure this logic using raw code, which I do not recommend, <laughs> finite state machines, behavior trees, or utility matrix. Those are kind of like equivalent, but not really. They all serve to build algorithms that are driving the utility of your NPCs. And they are kind of like the sets of rule that trigger your little behaviors. Awesome, play with it. Get back to me if you have questions. Okay, utility. So uh, utility is kind of like faking the decision the way uh, humans understand decisions, right? So the way, uh, if you look into the rules of, of economics, economics are kind of like the math for human interactions and how we, we make trades and understand the world and take decisions, right? So uh, basically, it's taking, choosing what's, uh, what's going to happen and uh, what could happen and try to get the best out of it. So do you go, like, what di which direction to go? What decision should I make? What, what should we eat tonight? The, the never never uh, ending question, of course. So let's say that we have this this small agent here, very cute, um, and uh, we basically 
usually what happens is that we, we pre-program NPCs to, to have some desires, so they want certain outcomes, and they also have fear. So in this case, uh, if I was asking you guys, like, what would you eat? What would you pick? Usually most people pick the cake. Uh, from a, a very extensive survey I ran on all my other presentations. But the condition in which this selection happened will influence the outcome. So maybe this very small, tiny NPC uh, is on a diet or really like apple. It's like his favorite thing. Or maybe he ate 57 cakes and maybe he cannot eat more cake and maybe he will just choose to not take action in this case. So all of those things are things that we have to think about when we are uh, game designers. And, and we have to, to basically think of all possible cases and ensure that we have patterns that cover those cases um, and try to deal with exceptions. So from, from those fear and desires and potential arising strategy, what we're going to do is we're going to make it in a way that the NPCs look rational. So a human that plays the game will be like, OK, so this NPC understand that they want this. And they understand that if they fail, this horrible thing will happen. But the um, they also uh, understand that the risk of this happening is very high or very low. And according to this, they will like they will have a better chance of doing it or no. So basically, it it depends on the context. But if I give you like a quick example, um, if I'm I'm a I'm an NPC and I'm hiding behind cover here, and my player is like further this way, um, and I'm low on HP, I might want to stay in cover, go on the side and shoot. Or I might want to like go to this other cover here that gives me like a better vintage point. But like doing this, I have to like travel like this, and that increases my chance of being shot. But if I have zero percent chance of hitting a player here, and maybe like forty-five percent uh, chance if I, I hide here, then it might be worth it to sacrifice my motion in space for this one. So um, so yeah, like if the NPC thinks it's acceptable, they will perform something. If it's not acceptable, they will try not to, but sometimes they don't have a choice. So uh, the way we do this is, and the, here we'll use the, the behavior tree because it's the mostly used one, uh, the most widely used one. Um, so yeah, like let's say that we have like three types of behavior with uh, with the sub patterns here. So uh, let's say that I am here and and then I go down and I'm like, okay, so can I go can I go idle? Is there like a source of threat detected? No. Okay, so chill and idle, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is there a, a, a threat still detected? Yes. What do I do? And then I will hit the second conditional here and I'd be like, okay, do I enter combat or do I just run away? Uh, and then once I'm in combat, do I go like full on offensive, like super aggressive, or do I just go and hide somewhere? Uh, and behind something, but still attack? Or do, do I just like flee and run away completely far, far away? So uh, usually the, the answer to this will depend on like a super long list of, of criteria. But if I give you like a simple version, uh, what we could do to make your NPC more interesting is that if your HP is full uh, and that the player is detected, you cannot go in idle anymore. But uh, when you enter combat, we will change. We will put basically like this um, uh, the chance of selecting combat, because like all of those little percentages are basically like rolling the dice if you want. The percentages of of like selecting offensive combat is going to be a lot higher than uh, taking defense or flee. But you still want them to like take cover once in a while. But they will be more bold and proactive, and they will risk their health a little bit more. Um, and if you go with uh, an, an NPC that has 20% left of HP, so they're close to death and they know, uh, what they're going to do most of the time, we program them to basically like enter a little bit less in offens offensive combat, because if there is more than one of them, uh, the more people you have, the more uh, the aggro of the player is distributed, and the ones that are more healthy will try to take the aggro. So it's going to give this impression. So the ones that are a little bit weaker will try to stay alive. So while the player is being damaged by the stronger ones, they might, and if they die, like they might still have a chance to like give the, la the last shot somewhere. Uh, but you will see that defensive has a higher rate of selection and flee might also be a chance of selection. Usually for a combat unit, we do a lot less of fleeing because they look a little bit um, 
a little bit like sad and, and not proactive, but it's the kind of stuff that we do for uh, standby people or like civilians or whatever. Uh, and now we will talk about, uh, now that we're done with uh, the human computer interaction uh, loop for, for um, NPCs, we're gonna talk about making archetypes. Uh, building archetypes is like, the basics of how to understand the, the context of each of your type of characters and how they connect to each other. So you can reuse and, 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 um, and basically uh, reuse and recycle most of your content. So like either uh, like utility uh, wise or for, for like all of your algorithms or, or for your voices or your animations uh, and, and behaviors and context and environments. So usually we do something like this. We usually have a like kind of like a, a pawn class, like basically this is like characters uh, that go around in your world, uh, and then from this we're gonna derive the 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 kind of like pattern of what is a human player, and then we're gonna do the same for an NPC, and then in between you will have the bots that usually inherit from those two classes, um, and then sometimes the player have the choice of using more than one uh, avatar uh, if if it's the case we're going to define for each of them what's the difference between the stats and, and like the way they interact with the world like how do they attack uh, what's the difference what makes them special if nothing makes them special keep one change the color that's it um, and then the bot also uh, since it's close to what the player is doing usually inherit something similar. And if you have characters that can be played either by a human or a bot, you usually have two different avatars that are uh, structured in a way that uh, enable or disable some stuff for the human and for the, for the bot. Then you have NPCs. Uh, the, the NPCs usually uh, for, for like, reusableness, re 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 uh, like structure and everything, what we do is we kind of like tier them. So the bus are usually like super cool. We put a lot of effort, everything is custom, everything is great, environment is custom, everything, but we see them only once and it's like a big event and we don't have many of them. Mini buses usually they reoccur more than once. Uh, they might evolve through times, but like basically they are semi-custom. They do some specific things, and sometimes they use environment, but not that much. Uh, and then we usually have minions. So like those are the the basically the the units that you can like throw away. And they, there's like million of them. So usually those guys, what we do is we make little like build kits uh, with like many hair and many like t-shirts and mini whatever and and they kind of like vary a little bit from one to another um, and we even sometimes like take one of those types and like sub break it into other types uh, and this allows us to reuse those build kits and those voices and those things but just like change some of their behaviors to make them uh, different flavor wise so if we use uh, an example of a, a concrete board game, which I recommend for every people that are trying to, to do AI, uh, I would say Zombicide because it's, it's kind of like level design the game. And part of the rules is basically operating the AI and then playing the player. So in this game, if we take again the MDA framework, this is again what the NPCs are doing. This is why I recommend the game. Um, what we would do if I was to make the archetypes in this game is I would try to see what the player does and then try to make something uh, that matches the matches like the, the capacity of the player. So like the player walks and it goes around and it deals damage. So the same thing for the, the NPCs. And usually what you're trying to do is you, you try to find combos of stats that gives you like an experience that is easy, average, and then very hard. And then basically you, you generate those stats first and then you go see your artist people. And then you, you're like, hey, so how can I address this guy? Like, what should it look like? Like, what are the voices and the stuff I can use? And yum, yum, yum. And then artists will come up with very com concept, like cool concept and stuff. And like, let's say that you go and pitch this to your creative director. What's going to happen is that this guy is going to be like, hey, not enough, um, not enough variety in your game. In this case, what they did, and this is genius, they just added an extra uh, variable call, like I would call it distance to player. And basically the green ones, if distance to player is zero, so if they are in the same case and they die, they will deal damage to all the players on the on the on the, the tile. The green one, you can kill close or far away. There's no issue. And for these guys, like 
the, um, the distance to player must be zero to be killed. So with, with one extra variable that is like minus one, zero, or plus one, in this case, you create like an infinite variety of patterns. So AI doesn't have to be complex. It just has to be very smart. So uh, if we compare to uh, archetypes of brain, for example, uh, if we have a mercenary, let's say they can do most of it. Sometimes, uh, for, for example, in a, the case of a civilian archetype, we will trim some of the branches. So there's some stuff they cannot do. Uh, and it's interesting because when you look at them going, because they're, they're, the tree is the same, but the animation they perform are slightly different, it gives the impression of a completely different brain, even if they have the same thing under the hood. Uh, we also uh, use percentages of percentages to generate personality. Uh, my favorite example of that is, uh, of course, Gandhi <laughs> from Civilization. Until Civilization 2 or 3, uh, Gandhi had a bug in it, which meant that in his decision to alliance or no, if you were too friendly to, uh, to, to Gandhi, the, the variable for start to store friendship would bit shift. And then what would happen is that it would go from the highest possible state of friendliness to like full on nuclear war and like then happened the, the meme of nuclear Gandhi and we loved him. And it was so funny because the community, like the, the, the people making the game were like, oh my God, like this is horrible. Let's fix this. And co the, the community was like, no, this is amazing. So they left it broken in the game for like two or three duration of the game. And I thought this was great. So percentages of percentages may create personality, creates bugs also, but sometimes it's endearing. So play with your stats. Okay, so your AI is done, this is awesome, and you set them free in the world, right? No, this is how you get emergence, and this is horrible. So what we do is we create little meta rules that are called contextual overrides. We're gonna go very fast because we're reaching the end. Um, so it's like a very fast board game again, but this time you have more than one NPC at the same time, and they all have their separate sets, sets of rules. So if we look at this here, um, my boss, my former boss would say, oh, this is an accident. So accident is not an entity you can place in the world. Accident is a series of rules that conflicts with each other and then wreck the shit with your crowd, for example. So the rules here are pedestrian will cross the, the light at the intersection when the, the, the light is green. Then car will stop at the intersection uh, at the red light 85% of the time. So sometimes they just pass, pass through. And then pedestrians, which are the people in the background, will look at NPCs when they're being injured. So they just like circle and look with what's going on. Uh, and the paramedic that finds someone who's injured will stop and will try to come and help. And a police entity will come and, and like and see someone like an NPC hurting another NPC will engage and will try to arrest this person. So all of those NPCs are unaware of what the other ones are doing. The only thing they're looking for is like little tags in the environment that says like, the light is green, the light is red, uh, this NPC is injured, this, uh, and, and, uh, and like this NPC injured someone else. That's it. And then from all this thing, like those kinds of event, events can, can arise. So this is basically like an emergent episode of thing happening. So sometimes it's nice. This is sometimes what you want. Sometimes it's not. So what we do is we create contextual overrides. So those are like little handcuffs for your NPC brains. I don't know how to explain it otherwise. Uh, we use volumes. We use smart objects. And we use also like world uh, or data or like progression data or NPC data. So uh, volumes are usually placed in the world and they're usually like uh, positioned uh, with usually like a world data, like for example, like this mission is active. So like every NPC spawn in this radius is gonna be like a mercenary type and it's gonna be angry by default. Or uh, if you're an ambient light civilian, do not go and throw yourself in there. Uh, my favorite example was with uh, Far Cry. At some point, uh, one of our level designers were, forgot to put the volume around its cutscene. So uh, in the case of Far Cry, the, the wildlife just goes rampant in the background and they do whatever. Uh, but in a cutscene, we make that uh, other, like the big animals and stuff cannot come in and, and like wreak havoc, right? Makes sense. Uh, in this case, my LD forgot. And then what happened is that in a review, a jaguar or something came in, picked up the mission giver that was talking to player and just ran away. And the game broke. 
because there's this is not a, a state that is usually <laughs> maintained by the game. So I had to, and then my boss was like, Meh. and then um, like me and my my friend were like, fuck, and then we went back to uh, our 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 LD friend being like, what the hell happened? It was like, no, I didn't put the thing. I was lazy, and then we're just like, mm. uh, no, we we scolded him, and then uh, we fixed the situation. But it's the kind of things that is very small but very useful. And you can do everything with this. You can force behaviors, constrain behavior, make stuff happen, uh, make people like NPCs work together or stop working together. Like all of those things are very cool. Uh, we also use uh, like smart objects. Those are basically objects with little handles, like mathematical concepts all over them. And they also contain a little bit of NPC brain inside. So uh, for example, this turret here will like throw stems in the air of like touch me touch me and then little npcs that walks by we're like oh, okay cool and then they put their hand on a little little handle that have little mathematical construct for this and then the brain of the turret is going to override the npc's brain and will teach them how to to like shoot player and do things and this brain is going to operate the npc as long as it touches the turret and once in a while, the Tourette's going to look like, do I release the NPC? OK, cool. And then it goes away. The same thing for the door. Is This is the reason why NPCs stopped dying in doors like five years ago. Now we have constructs around your door. Like we don't make the NPC aim through the door. We just like send NPC to the place where it puts his, his feet next to the to the door and then we make them go through with like the door brain animation. And if they get shot as they're going through, the door says to the NPC, hey, we notice that you're currently dying. Step, take two steps to the left, and then they die. They do their death animation towards the towards the left, and this way they don't die in the hallway. Awesome, it's great. And we can also use these to for like normal environment things, or to constrain, like for example, hostages in, in a situation, or like force an NPC to, I don't know, look through the window longingly. All those things. Um, we also use contextual override for like uh, with use like world data. So, for example, if some uh, world char characteristic are true, for example, this guy here will be like, "No, I'm guarding this place." But if you come back later. Uh, this position might be empty and you might be able to sneak in. The same thing with uh, data like insights. So for example, in The Sims, they have a lot of like NPC data uh, that override each other. So some behavior will be available to the player to select Actually, in the case of, of, of The Sims, you play the, the character's AI. This is amazing, awesome. Uh, but yeah, so options will be available to you according to their mood or what's going on. And like some event will be reinforcing other events. And it's also very interesting. So this is how we uh, write the bleeding edge of chaos. Uh, if we quickly talk about relatableness, uh, yeah, so you will have to choose stuff for your NPCs. Usually designers don't choose those, but we we let uh, we, we curate the choices. Uh, and the core of the ban of our existence is animation voice and information consistency. Uh, so in the case of animation, having stuff blend together is an incredible nightmare. So having actions performed uh, while like adding a layer for being shot in the knee and being sad at the same time is still a nightmare to this day. We're working on it. And for this, we use AI, but it's still uh, actual machine learning, uh, but it's not its not a, a one uh, system. Same thing for voice. If you want to have a, a voice that is simulating, like um, generated by a machine, uh, it still sucks. <laughs> Siri is living proof of non-living proof of that. Um, but it's even worse if you're trying to record a, a voice for, from a, from an actor and then add an emotion or an excerpt at the same time. So if you want to say hi, neutral, happy, and sad, you have to record the same line three times. Each line in a, in a game costed $100 to put in. From the moment it's written, to the moment it's debugged and like every step in between in average is a hundred dollar so for for like very well-rounded groups that do this all the time uh and the same thing with information consistency uh most of uh the bigger games except some of them uh don't spend a lot of time trying to give personality or give the impression that there are npcs in the environment that are not super specific remember things and this is very sad. And that's why <laughs> when uh, Shadow of Mordor came out with the orcs being like, I'm going to, I remind, I remember you and I will kill you, blah, blah, blah. You did this and blah, blah, blah. The fact that those orcs remembered what happened, which is not true, by the way, is like six variables. 
And like when that happened, all the players around the world were like, oh my God, remember me? It's the worst. Like, oh, this is so good. This is six variables. I was so offended. And like everybody was like, how did they do this? I was like, six variables, constraints on how to build encounters. That's all. So if you have more questions about this, let's talk about it later. Okay, so we're running out of time and we have three minutes left. I'm so sorry. If you have more questions, uh, ping me. So send me information and stem through email or whatever else. Uh, remember, current AI is like animations in the 90s. You remember when you had like this pushed animation and like through in the air animation and like fall on the ground animation and then, oh, you're above a hole. Oh, now fall animation. AI is currently this, doing the same thing. So give us time. We're going to improve. It's going to be great. And uh, deeper agents give better gameplay. And this creates a, a newer, better, safer place to learn how to be human. That's it. I know we don't have that much time for questions, but let's try. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> gosh. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You are hilarious. <laughs> I think that my favorite thing was um, I make fake homicidal, homicidal people, people and I love my job. That is <laughs> awesome. It's very nice, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's funny. And then you, I don't, you said something, and then you're all meow, meow, meow. Um, awesome. That was super interesting. That was like because I didn't never really understood that stuff. I mean, I knew that there was variables and we got programmed, but that was like really interesting. There was all different types. So here we go. Let's do some questions before we want to kick you out. I could listen to this for another hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so bold, bold spirit game studio, maybe too much of a specific question, but do you think it's possible to make a pretty good AI with only using blueprints from um, unreal engine four, like for example, a boss battle? Thanks. Yes. Okay. So uh, unreal is like kind of like awesome and horrible at the same time, because they have very specific construct and concept for uh, structures of programming. Blueprint is very good and you can make behavior trees with these and also state machines. So it's kind of like flexible in that way. You have to have a good idea of what your, uh, your bus fight is going to look like. And remember that a bus fight is like a little dense choreography in a sense that you will have steps. And it's also like your music score in a sense that you will want to have like very high moments and like moment that are more like quiet and silent so you're you're uh, it's kind of like waves of intensity so your player can like reposition them, themselves and like just like build back up and be able to to like reattack and, and and succeed in a way so you have to think about this and build your behaviors uh like your little snippets so they enable this you want shorter snippets also because they they will have a higher chance of being um interrupted by a punch or something and your battle arena should be tagged with a series of elements so uh, so it can use the environment to either um, help the player or, or like hinder the player in a way or player can also like for example break your pillar and make it like harder for it to move or all those kind of things and if you do so you have to spend a lot of time like ensuring that those environment things are still challenging and fun and there's no way to cheat with it but but yeah like blueprint is super awesome i recommend it like please and and the unity equivalent now is bolt uh so like in those two cases it's it's awesome uh take a look and and like build little incremental bus fights and then at some point you'll find what you like that's awesome okay well it, we would answer this the, are you gonna hang out in the discord for a little bit sure yeah yeah i'm here okay, for like so... another hour Everybody, uh, if you if you got more questions for Stephanie, you can go into the Discord, discord.gg slash indie game business. Um, there's a voice channel, but there is also um, post session chat. It's hashtag post session chat. It's a channel in there. Um, Stephanie can hang out in there and answer questions. And maybe if you want to do voice, um, she, <laughs> she might do that as well. Hey, what's up, Bargalar? Welcome, buddy. Um, but yes, we have somebody coming up next. I would... I, I, need, I should have been looking at what what's going on here. Who do we got next? We have do, 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 do. Christian Fonsbeck. Passion is good, but passion plus IP is better. That's going to be an interesting talk. So, yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, jump on the Discord, everybody. Of and course. There's something. AMA questions. Oh, here we go. There's also someone posted in, in AMA questions over in the Discord. Yeah, so you guys get on over there. So, yes, uh, I stop sharing, I guess, and I leave. Bye. Um, oh, yeah, in one second, I will end this broadcast, and then you can go. <laughs>